Welcome back to the Tom Anderson Show, the best company on your morning drive in Alaska on KBNT 1020 AM and 92.5 FM. Online at TomAndersonShow.com, 6 AM to 9 AM Alaska time. Want to join us? Call 907-357-5868. That's 357-5868. Good morning, America. Here's Tom Anderson. Well, or not. This is Brad Keithley sitting in for Tom today as Tom's on vacation. But I have, I have the opportunity when I get to sit in on shows like this, and particularly on Tom's show, since uh, we have an audience that is focused on uh, fiscal issues and on spending and on budgets. I have the opportunity to bring on guests uh, to talk about um, uh, uh, those sorts of issues and to, and to delve down into what's really going on with uh, governmental fiscal policy and what's going on with budgets. We're very fortunate today to be joined by Maya McGinnis. I feel very fortunate today to be joined by Maya McGinnis. Maya is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. As I said earlier, uh, from my way of thinking, the the best uh, of breed uh, in terms of budget hawks, uh, organizations looking out at the federal budget, uh, and advocating and, and, and doing analysis with respect to ways that we can bring the federal budget under control. Uh, Maya, you won't know this, but I actually have been a longtime fan of the, of the organization. Uh, I was in Oklahoma when Henry Bellman was, uh, was governor and then senator and then organized the CRFB way the heck back. So uh, it's great to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So you knew about the CRFB probably before I did then. That's really great to hear. Well, uh, Governor Bellman, Senator Bellman was a, was a hero of mine. He was for people that, <laughs> for the small number of people that may remember this, uh, Henry was the first Republican governor uh, in uh, Oklahoma history when he was elected uh, in 1962, went on to become a senator, uh, served as the initial chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, and then uh, was instrumental in forming the CRFB. So, uh, it's a, it's an organization I've held in high regard uh, for a long time, and I'm and I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. Why don't, for for those who are listening, why don't you describe the CRFB just a little bit so they have that background? Yeah, I will. So first off, um, it's got the hardest to rem- remember name in the whole world: the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, and I became interested in this issue sort of in the beginning of my career. And I'm a political independent, and I thought, I'm really worried about budget deficits. The more I studied them, the more concerned I became. I thought I'd really like to someday find an organization that is bipartisan, that focuses on fiscal issues. Um, And so the way I came across the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget was when their founding president was departing, and somehow we were connected. Basically, I got offered the best job I could ever imagine. Because what this organization does is it is, as you said, founded by people who had worked in Congress of both parties who are really concerned about the issue. And it has a board of directors who are the people who have run the Congressional Budget Office, the Office of Management and Budget, the Budget Committees, the Treasury, the Fed. They worked in government on the issues, meaning they understand how hard it is politically to make changes, but they also understand and are committed to how important it is to make those changes And they realize, and I think this is very true, it has to be done in a bipartisan way. If there's not enough political cover because the choices involved are difficult, it just will be politically too difficult to make the necessary changes to get our country back on a sound fiscal policy. So it's a small D.C. think tank, very bipartisan. I think we put out very sort of credible, well-regarded numbers. Um, And then also a few years ago, we started a partner organization called the Campaign to Fix the Debt which brought in an outside game, people across the country who are pushing their lawmakers to be more responsible in budgeting and pushing for a grand bargain or a big deal that would help get our debt back down to more manageable levels. Because whenever, if and when they come up with solutions, there is always a huge vocal and well-financed lobbying effort against those changes. And so we want to put together grassroots citizens who actually cared about improving the debt to show that there was support for it for members of Congress when they have to make those choices. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll admit, that's sort of what, uh, when I started seeing fix the debt, uh, uh, the fix the debt tagline and fix the debt tweets, uh, and, and Mark and you referring to fix the debt uh, in, your, 
in your discussions. That's sort of what brought me in because I saw an opportunity, uh, frankly, to to participate and be part of the effort to try to try to do that. Our the Alaska delegation is small, uh, but but at least our way of thinking, it's mighty. It's got uh, Lisa Murkowski, who's certainly has become a swing vote uh, in the Senate, uh, sits on Senate appropriations. Dan Sullivan, who's uh, who wants to be and has become is becoming a major player. Uh, on military matters, sits on uh, armed services, uh, and, and military certainly is a is a segment of spending that that people talk about a lot. And then we have Don Young, the dean of the house. Uh, I don't think mm-hmm. he he doesn't sit on appropriations, but but certainly uh, has a way about him uh, uh, to carry things. So um, it, it's an issue that I think we in Alaska can can actually have have some participation in uh, through trying to uh, affect uh, the, the course that our that our congressional delegation takes. Yeah, and to that point, because members of Congress almost never hear from their constituents saying, we want you to fix this problem. We know that the choices are hard, and we'll talk about the policy, but in the end, you know, they are going to require controlling government spending, fixing our entitlement programs, and getting more revenue. Those are all the hard things. What members of Congress love is cutting taxes and increasing spending. This is the opposite. This is, this is curbing those things. But when they hear from even one voter who calls in and says, I want you to fix the debt, and I'm willing to stand by you and support the policies that would do that, as opposed to the thousands of calls they get saying, keep your hands off this program or this tax break or give me this, they really do notice. So to, to magnify your point, I think, um, and especially in a state like Alaska where people are closer to their members and the members are more aware of what voters are thinking, um, I think you can have a really disproportionate effect by just having a small enough group of people still willing to be vocal about this is something that is a, a public interest issue and we have to work on it as a country. We're going to come back to that at the end of the discussion in the, in the next segment about what we can do here, but that certainly, that certainly gives, a, gives an, uh, a, a good framework about, about this discussion. So where are we? Let, let's talk just for a moment about where are we on the, on the deficit and the national debt. Are we headed in the right direction? Or are we headed in the wrong direction? If we're headed in the wrong direction, how far off track have we gotten? Right. So the, the fiscal state of the country is really not good. Um, we're, we, are, we are in really bad shape, and we're headed into worse shape. So let me throw out some numbers for context. Um, and, of course, when you talk about budget deficits, everything's huge. It's in trillions. It's so hard to sort of put that in a context. But um, I will do my best and suffice it to say the problem is bad and it's growing worse. So the most important way to think about our national debt is as a share of the economy. Um, the debt held by the public is almost $15 trillion. The total debt is $21 trillion. Obviously, those are big numbers. But the most helpful thing is to think it's about it's a little bit over three-quarters of the size of our economy, and that is twice as large as it has been historically. So generally, our debt is below 40% of GDP, goes up and down, depends if you've just had a recession or just had a war, but on average, it's been 38% of GDP. Importantly, that's how much it was when we entered the big downturn in 2008, the big recession. Um, And the reason that matters so much is having a strong, sound budget when your economy goes into a recession helps you have the tools to respond to it. There's monetary policy, what the Fed does, and there's fiscal policy, whether the government cuts taxes or increases spending or creates stimulus when you're in a recession. If your debt is much higher the way ours is now, that's a tool you have a lot less of when you hit a recession. So 77... Yep. So, so Alaskans will say, yeah. So it grew a lot during the Obama administration, and and it's it's really gotten high, and that's you know one of the reasons we elected uh, President Trump to to come in and fix that situation. So, are we on the road to fixing that situation? <laughs> yeah. So, right, it did grow a lot under the Obama administration, and it, it appears that it's going to grow by a lot more under the Trump administration. So, right now, where we are, that debt that's Three-quarters of the economy, 77%, is projected to go to about 100% over the next decade. We tend to look at budgets and what's going to happen over the next 10 years. It is going to grow to soon to an unprecedented level. And again, right now, we're the highest we've ever been other than right after World War II. And then the, the debt improved significantly as the economy boomed. Right now, even if we don't hit a recession... The debt is, continu- is projected to grow every single year, 
faster than the economy. And that, by definition, is unsustainable. That's when you know you're in real trouble. And unfortunately, um, the, the economy is doing pretty well under President Trump, but what's not doing well is our fiscal situation. We are now headed towards having trillion-dollar deficits in just over a year from now, and an entire half of that deficit comes from policies we just passed in the past year, both on the tax cut side, we had a massive tax cut, and we just had a massive increase in spending on defense and domestic discretionary. Those big changes, combined with a couple other small things, doubled the size of the deficit we're about to have, and it's going to keep growing every year. So, no, unfortunately, we are nowhere close to a path where this is going to get better. It's projected to get worse, and we'd have to put in very large savings to get us uh, not even just to a balanced budget, which almost feels like a pipe dream these days, but to a situation where that debt isn't growing faster than the economy. So we're, when we come back, I'm going to lead off with the question, um, uh, but we're supposed to be growing out of this. We had a tax, tax cut. We're supposed to be growing out of this. Don't answer it now. We'll answer it when we come out. Uh, of the break. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Social Security. This is Brad Keithley sitting in today for Tom Anderson. We have our guest, Maya McGinnis, the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, on the line. We're going to continue that discussion after the break. We're on the line with uh, Maya McGinnis. Maya is the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, one of the best, uh, uh, well, the best uh, budget hawk organizations uh, in D.C., Maya, we were talking about the state of the of national debt. We were st- talking about the state of the budget, um, and and the fact that the that the deficit is growing and, and the national uh, debt is uh, is growing uh, as well. Uh, a question that we sort of left off that I that I want to come back to as we hit this is tax cuts. We just had a big tax cut. The president tells us, uh, 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 Speaker of the House Ryan, Mitch McConnell tell us that tax cuts are great. They're going to spur the economy. We're going to grow our way uh, out of this deficit through all of the additional economic growth and the related uh, uh, revenue, tax revenue that's going to generate um, uh, uh, going forward. Uh, is that is that what is happening? Is that what what people are seeing happen? Well, what happened was we had massive overpromising of what the tax cuts could de- deliver, and the result is huge budget deficits. So what we really did need was tax reform. Our tax code was a complete abomination, right? Any of us who pays taxes knows it's way too complicated. It's not fair. Your neighbor pays one thing. You pay a totally different thing, even if you make the same amount of money. We needed to simplify the tax code. And importantly, on the corporate side, we needed to improve the things that would make us more competitive. Our tax rates were much too high compared to our international competitors. However, we did have big budget deficits. So what we didn't need to do was make those budget deficits bigger. And in 1986, the last time we did tax reform, there was a great model. You broadened the tax base. And what that means is you got rid of tons of the credits, deductions, loopholes that are all throughout the tax code, making it look like Swiss cheese. And you use that money to bring rates down. But it's not easy because it requires hard choices. And this time, our politicians were unwilling to make those hard choices either of getting rid of the tax breaks most of which still exist, or of cutting spending. If they wanted to have tax cuts, where you actually lowered how much taxes we collect, you have to cut spending. Otherwise, you're just borrowing all the money and giving the bill to our kids. That's what we ended up doing. We borrowed well over a trillion dollars. And the big problem is that tax reform can grow the economy, realistically nowhere near enough to actually pay for itself. It grows the economy and then higher tax revenues come in, but from a smaller amount. So you still lose revenue. But it, it can create growth unless you borrow to pay for it, because then the higher debt levels actually slows down economic growth. That's what we had, a plan where the lower tax rates could help growth, but the much higher debt is going to hurt growth. All told, the growth effects of this tax plan are affected to be close to zero. Some people say negative. Some people say slightly positive. No credible estimator out there has a model that shows this tax plan will pay for itself. So we have growth that's coming from stimulus, kind of a sugar high, if you will. We put a lot of money into the economy when the economy is doing well, but it's not going to last. Nobody's predicting it will last, and it is going to leave us with a mountain of debt. So I'm really, really, I really regret we didn't do actual tax reform, which could have had 
dividends for the country for years to come. But instead, we've left us with much, much higher borrowing. One of the, one of the statistics that, uh, or one of the, the analyses that I think is, it, it puts stops people in their tracks when we talk about it uh, in Alaska. In fact, uh, usually people start out by saying I'm lying when I say this. Uh, but it's it's a comparison of the Obama administration against the Trump administration, and the Obama administration, yes, did run tr- trillion dollar deficits during the uh, during the first term. People remember that Obama a billion dollar or billion or trillion dollar debts, trillion, trillion dollar deficits during the first term. But during the second term, they started coming down. And in fact, if we hadn't had tax reform or the the tax cuts that we're that we're talking about. And and the additional spending that happened uh, earlier this year, we'd be down to a to a, uh, a deficit of around 480 billion, 500 billion, well below uh, a trillion. But now, with these tax cuts, and particularly with the addition, the hike hike of the of the spending that we had in February, March, we're talking about trillion dollar deficits through the entire Trump term, uh, through both terms. I mean, it's for eight years going into the future. You are exactly right. And I know that the problem is that this is issue of fiscal responsibility tends to get so politicized. And again, I'm a political independent. People can want a smaller government. People can want a bigger government. Nobody's right or wrong in this fight. But the point that we try to make is you need to have a government that if you want to spend more money, you're willing to pay for it. And if you want to cut taxes, you're willing to spend, you're willing to cut spending along with it. And what we had in the Obama administration was huge trillion dollar deficits that came from a big, big downturn. And they did start to come down. Even then, though, the debt was still too high. And what we should have done and we didn't do was put in place a big plan. Simpson Bowles was a great one that was out there, a plan that would have brought our debt back down closer to more standard levels that wouldn't hurt the economy. We didn't do that. Um, Both sides kind of played a role in not getting a, a big debt deal done. So even when deficits came down, our debt was still growing. And now it's growing much faster. And it is, as you pointed out, to have trillion-dollar deficit when the economy is strong like it is now, that is the height of irresponsibility, and it's completely self-imposed. Our policymakers voted for a big tax cut, which they didn't offset the cost, again, either through base broadening or cutting spending, and then they turned around and passed a huge spending increase, which they didn't even pretend to try to offset. Um, the irony is they raised the debt ceiling along with a plan that increased the debt. So what you have right now, what I kind of think of it in Washington, is free lunch economics. Everybody's pretending you can fix this because the programs will just pay for themselves or we'll grow our way out of it or maybe magic will come along. You know, this isn't true. And we as voters have to let our, our legislators know that this plan of unsustainable borrowing, and it really does leave an economy that's kind of in shambles for the next generation, which is the opposite of what the American economic dream is supposed to be for our kids, this plan can't go on. And and I would also say so much of it, in my mind, is a reflection of the political dysfunction we're now seeing. Two parties constantly fighting, trying to over outbid each other in this world of free lunch economics. And we kind of need the grown-ups to take over and say we have to start making some real choices and confront trade-offs and put in place a long-term sustainable economic plan for this country. That, that feeds into a conversation that Rick and I were having, frankly, before you came on about, about uh, you know, analogizing budgets to a family and parents being in charge. And, and we have this problem in Alaska. We've sort of had the kids in charge. You know, one kid wants a new car. One kid wants a, you know, around-the-world trip. One kid, and, and we've said yes to all of it and have put, a, put yeah. ourselves in, into this shape in the state level. We have, we have about two minutes left. I want to spend a, a, just that amount of time on Social Security. Uh, trust fund has come, the Social Security Trust Fund has come out with reports that said we're headed for um, insolvency. We're headed to run through the, uh, the reserve that we build up in Social Security uh, by the early 2030s uh, and a significant cut in benefits. Uh, can you sort of capsulate that about what the problem is and, and what we can do to fix it quickly? Absolutely. And that's right. The trustees warn us every year we need to do something. There are a lot of ways to fix Social Security the only thing we should not be doing is burying our head in the sand and pretending we don't have to. And anyone who says we don't need to fix Social Security is just not owning up to the reality. The reason this is happening is it's a good reason. We're living longer. When the program started, the retirement age was 65. Life expectancy was 62. Now as we're living so much longer and the retirement age has only gone up slightly, the money, the money just isn't there to cover benefits. 
we need to make changes. There are all sorts of things we can consider. We can gradually grow the retirement age for people who can work longer. We can slow the growth of benefits, maybe for people who need them less while keeping them for people who depend on the program. You can increase either the payroll tax rate or the cap, how much we pay money on, um, how much we pay of our taxes on our wages. You can adjust inflation. We overstate inflation. So there's all sorts of things we can do. But the point is, every year we wait, it becomes harder, more expensive, and, and really importantly, it jeopardizes the people who depend on the program. So please let your politicians know that we need a fix. Let's move away from if we have to fix it. We, of course, we have to. The trustees tell us that and move into how we can fix it. We actually have a social security fixer on our website where we invite people to come and figure out the fixes they would do and send it to their lawmakers. Um, it is not impossible. We can get this done, but we have to work uh, to start making those changes as quickly as possible. Well, that's a pitch I want to pick up on as, as we have to, unfortunately, close this segment, which is the CRFB website. It's, C, it's CRFB, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, dot org. Great resources, great tools on that website. Maya, your organization is doing a great job, and I hope Thank Alaskans you. pick up on it and continue to watch it. Yeah. Thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks so much for having me. Great to talk to you. Absolutely. This has been Brad Keithley with Maya McGinnis. I'm sitting in for Tom Anderson. We'll be back with the final segment of today's show in just a moment.